Thank you very much and a warm welcome to Innsbruck from my side. Can you hear me well if I don't use the microphone? Because then I need both hands to talk. <laughs> that makes my life a lot easier. So let me first, uh, before I get into my talk, I would like to know from you what this, what this picture puzzle means. Schizophrenia? Yeah? Any other, any other thoughts? So I'll make it easy. Okay, this, is, this means schizophrenia. Now the reason I'm showing this to you is all of you have fairly quickly recognized it has something to do with schizophrenia because you can do abstract interpretation of what you see here. A person with schizophrenia would tell you the following. He would look at this and say, well, um, I see that this could be a pair of skis and then there is a mountain that's sort of exploding uh, maybe a volcano, then as a plus sign, then I see the word zoo and a panda bear eating something green. Then I see another pl plus and then I see P-H-R-E-N, I don't know what that means, another plus sign. And then I see uh, an animal, possibly a donkey, I-A-A-H. All of this is totally correct, of course. But what this person cannot do is link these things together in an abstract way to form the word schizophrenia, which is basically easy for most of the normal functioning brains that hopefully all of us can employ it, it still at this time of the day. But people with schizophrenia have difficulties in abstract reasoning and abstract thinking. This is the reason I'm, I'm always showing this to people who don't have a clinical understanding of the disorder just to familiarize you with the fact that this is a very complicated disorder. But let me go through, because I figured that for you it may be more interesting to understand that the basic concept of this, which is a very enigmatic, although fascinating disorder, probably the most fascinating disorder in, in the field of psychiatry. because. Most other psychiatric disorders you can more or less relate to. And if, if you look into yourselves, you can easily relate into anxiety disorders because you've all experienced anxiety at one point or the other, except of course for the real Tyrolians who never experience anxiety in the mountains because they're very tough. Hmm? The, you can also experience depression and you can realize, you can relate to someone who's depressed and sad. You can relate to someone who suffers from a substance use because sometimes you only want to eat one piece of chocolate but then you finish the whole bar hmm? unconsciously or consciously. So, but with the syndrome of schizophrenia is something that's very difficult to imagine for someone who's, who doesn't suffer from the disorder itself, even for people like myself who've been around schizophrenia patients for, I don't even want to tell you for how long, not to make me feel too old, but even for me it's still a very strange behavior and a very strange disorder, and, and that's part of the fascination of it. So I will now, let me see, I'll do this, if I, I can move it with the remote, theoretically, here we go. So what is the syndrome of schizophrenia? What's, in, in a very general overview, the, the basic concept of schizophrenia? Schizophrenia is, a, is a, a mental disorder, an illness that's characterized by disturbances in basically every aspect of life that you can imagine. Every part of a person with schizophrenia's character and characteristics and personality is affected by the disorder, whether it's emotions, whether it is thinking or cognitive functions, can also be emotional functioning or emotional intelligence, whether it is behavior, whether it is thoughts, whether it's experiences, where it's, whether it's uh, sensu sensory experiences, all of these are disturbed in one way or the other by people suffering from the disorder. This is why people sometimes confuse it with a personality disorder, which is something totally different. Even though the personality is affective, in the strict psychiatric diagnostic sense, schizophrenia is not a personality disorder. That's a borderline personality, for instance, something that you've all heard of, which is something totally different from schizophrenia. <clears throat> There's a huge range of symptoms, and these are, although there is a, a common core to most of these symptoms, these symptoms vary greatly 
inter-individually, not so much intra-individually. Generally, people who start with one part of the syndrome continue with these problems and hardly ever change their symptoms over the course of their lifetimes. But within different individuals, between different individuals rather that suffer from schizophrenia, there's, there's great variability, which sometimes makes diagnosis a challenge. <coughs> There are a certain subspecific syndrome domains, and I'll go into that in, in one of the next slides. But very importantly, and I pointed that out on that first riddle slide, is that these people next to their, next to their abnormal perceptions also have severe cognitive disturbances. Someone with severe schizophrenia, just to give you a, a, an understanding, has an intelligence quotient that's about as bad as someone with with medium severe Alzheimer's disease. So these people are really disturbed with respect to all their intellectual functions as well. <clears throat> so let me move to those symptoms that are probably most familiar to all of you. If you think schizophrenia, I guess and I'm not polling you again, but I guess most of you would think hallucinations or delusions, paranoid delusions, being followed, being watched over, being influenced by others, experience all of these kind of of uh, abnormal experiences. On the other hand, hallucinations, hearing, seeing things that aren't really there. So basically having a, a sensory perception that's not triggered by any sort of physical stimulus. So these people hear without actually being touched, physically touched uh, in, in, their, in, their, um, in their auditory system. But they still hear voices in the same, in the same loudness sometimes and also in the same quality as you now hear my voice. This is something that's a very common symptom and this is something that a lot of people relate to the problem with schizophrenia, although, although about a third of people that suffer from schizophrenia never experience hallucinations or delusions. They experience other parts of the syndrome, which again I'll point out to you as I go along my presentation. I, I'm not going to explain to you the, the basic psychopathology of the definition of delusions, but I think you're all w aware of the fact that these are very firmly held beliefs that cannot be, that cannot be um, corrected by, by any sort of logical explanation that they're not really true and that they're not reflecting reality. That, People really very strongly hold on to these delusions they have, and very often people are deluded in so far as that they feel that they feel guided, they feel influenced from the outside. Very often they feel influences from from physical matters. It used to be, by the way, it's changed over the years. Uh, about a hundred years ago, all the people with schizophrenia, not all of them, a lot of them suffered from religious delusions. They felt they were influenced by, by the Holy Trinity or that they, were, they had a vocation to save and to heal the world and to, become, to be prophets in a way. Nowadays, people have fewer religious beliefs and delusions. Nowadays, they're all influenced by computers, by the radio, by television, by Facebook, WhatsApp, what have you. This is the change of the phenomenology. But the basic concept that they're deluded still remains the same. It's just the content that has been, that has been moved and has been changed across the years. <clears throat> Then, disorganized speech is a very common phenomenon. People cannot hold on to a train of thought all the way into totally disorganized speech that you cannot really follow and relate to anymore because it's, it's, it's not understandable. It's not even understandable for the people who use it. They cannot really express themselves anymore. Just to give you an example, a schizophrenia patient who would, you know, walk into a room, you see the patient for the first time, and he very politely say hi, and I would say, hi, I'm Dr. Fleischacker, how are you? How can I help you? What brings you here? The patient would react in the following way. He would say, you are, you are a doctor. Um, F, a doctor with an F. F is a, a letter in the alphabet. C, what is this? Six. Alphabet is something that a lot of people believe in. I don't trust uh, numbers. Numbers are not letters, numbers, letters, numbers, letters. Are you, uh, uh huh. You say, um, I can, can I help you? Because, ah, Ah, the, the, the good spirits have, have um, 
Hmm. Um, I think I... It's very bright in uh, brightness falls upon you also. Hmm. So you, going back into my role in real life here, this is what a, people, what a person with an acute episode of schizophrenia might look like. A combination of totally disorganized speech, speech maybe some intrusive, deluded uh, thoughts, maybe some hallucinations of, of whatever sensory kind. So it's, it's a very serious, uh, as you can tell, phenomenon. And you can also understand that it's very difficult to relate to a person suffering from schizophrenia if you come from the healthy world. And the basic concept that everybody understands and experiences, these people really appear crazy. By the way, that's something a patient years ago mentioned when I was on call, and it was a similar story as the one that I've just played for you, and that at some point he looked at me and said, I know, doctor, you think I'm crazy. And then I said, yes. <laughs> and we both had to laugh hmm? for about five minutes until his, until his pattern of behavior totally changed again, and he went back into his psychotic mood. So they always have, there are remnants here also of, of normal personality. This is, by the way, very important also for treatment later, that you play on the resources, on the healthy resources that a lot of these patients still have, despite the fact that they may be very ill and, and very sick. <clears throat> the, sorry? I still cannot understand, because you are doing this diagnosis by talking to the patient observing his behavior and you have an ICD-10 to follow. How do you do a differential diagnosis? Like a patient has delirium and schizophrenia. Yeah. It's, I'll show you in one of the upcoming slides, I'll show you diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia. As in the rest of medicine, also in psychiatry, we have a diagnostic codex where certain symptoms or syndromes are grouped together and then form a diagnosis. And the differential diagnosis between delirium and, and the schizophrenia is fairly, fairly easy. One thing they may have in common, people with delirium, for instance, may also have hallucinations or delusions, but they will not have some of the other symptoms of schizophrenia that, that I'll come back to. So let me start with um, discussing a few of these syndrome domains. I've told you about what we call the positive symptoms. So these are hallucinations and delusions mainly, but also some, and I didn't go into detail, some motor behavior changes that these people may have. The concept of negative symptoms is a very important one for the simple reason it's not as obvious as someone who's deluded or has hallucinations if someone is you know, very, has a loss of energy, doesn't talk a lot, feels disaffected by any emotions going around him, is quiet, doesn't, doesn't really listen or doesn't speak, doesn't relate to other persons. These are often very withdrawn persons from, from the whole psychosocial context. Obviously, that's something that has a much higher level of tolerance by, by the rest of the world and by people living with such a person or being surrounded by by such persons. So this is something that is, is more difficult with respect to recognizing and diagnosing the disorder. And a lot of cases, a lot of cases of schizophrenia which go unrecognized are people who have more negative symptoms than the positive symptoms that I alluded to in the previous presentation. So these are the terms that we use here. Avolition basically is a lack of energy and drive. Aloja means that you talk less, not only from the perspective of the content of the presentation, but also with respect to, to the speed that people talk to and the, uh, and the amount of words that they produce or the amount of sentences they produce. Anhedonia reflects a feeling of not being able to experience pleasure. By the way, this is very difficult to differentiate from depression. 
it's not an easy task. You have to have a lot of clinical experience to understand the difference between mere anhedonia and, and clear-cut depression, which reflects the usual, the blue mood, being sad and hopeless. That's not what these people experience. They just don't experience any sort of positive emotional reinforcement. And all of this taken together, of course, leads to the fact that they usually withdraw from the community that something that's called asociality in, in some languages so that they're, they're outsiders, they're, they're weird people, they're strange, nobody really talks to them. Listen, to, does anyone know the, beat, the old Beatles song, The Fool on the Hill? Some of you do. Well, that, that nicely describes someone who may suffer from negative symptoms of schizophrenia. The fool on the hill is a perfectly strange, and he seems like a nice guy, but he doesn't relate to anybody, and, 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 and the other way around. So these would be, this would be the concept of negative symptoms. I've already told you that these people are also affected with respect to cognition. And, and generally, cognition, most of us th uh, think of cognition as a, as a um, neurocognition phenomenon, so impaired memory, impaired attention, impaired abstract thinking, impaired planning strategies, things that, that are sometimes put together as ex our executive functions, which, which allows us to, to live a real life and also to plan in advance and plan and think ahead and strategize. Th these are things that are very difficult for people suffering from schizophrenia. They live in the very concrete world, as I explained to you on that puzzle. You know, they, they, see, they don't see the overall picture, but they see separate compartments that are correct in themselves, but they don't get the meaning, they don't get the full picture of the story. And that's something that we call neurocognition, and then there is an important part of what we call social cognition. Now, social cognition is something that you're all familiar with, even though you may not have heard the term. Uh, you can easily detect when you hear me talking that this is, a, this is a, a talk, or this is a diagnosis, or these are patients that fascinate me, that, that interest me a lot, that, that, rouse, my, that rouse my spirits and, and everything, because I, I like to talk about it. On the other way, if I look at you, I can see that most of you are actually interested in what I'm saying. Hmm? Th these are very important social communications which make our life easier. Just imagine people that you talk to and you don't know, you have no feeling whatsoever what their current emotions with respect to talking to you are, with respect to social interaction. That makes it very difficult. And sometimes, if you think back into your own experience, sometimes you may start to have a little paranoid feelings uh, he's always looking at me in this very strange way. Maybe he thinks I'm a fool, I should get out of here, and this is not really a good presentation. It doesn't reach the point, and I'm missing my topic and things like that. So someone who doesn't sort of relate on this on this uh, emotional perception level makes it very difficult to judge, and some of us may feel insecure, a little anxious, and even may may enter into in, in the sort of pseudo-paranoid states when things like that happens. And this is also something that people with schizophrenia uh, experience. For instance, they misinterpret certain emotions. You show them, you've probably seen these emotion perception tests. You get shown pictures of someone who smiles, someone who looks very depressed, someone who's anxious, wide eyes, and things like that. When you show pictures of this to schizophrenia patients, they often mi misjudge the emotions they are seeing. For instance, a very common misjudgment is they misjudge fear for aggression. And you can imagine that's not a good thing to see someone who is really anxious, but you have the feeling that this person is aggressive. That doesn't make interactions very helpful. And, and very, more often than not, people also react in, in, a, uh, in an inconsistent way to the emotions of others for that reason. So this would be the, the emotional bit of expression or of cognition that these patients do have difficulties with. Lack of insight as th at the bottom here is, is very common. People who live in their paranoid and deluded worlds, they really live in these worlds. They have no insight that they are deluded or that they are sick because they think we are all sick. We don't understand it and we don't get it because we don't have the divine powers of understanding all the global problems of the world. And they only can do that. So they don't have any insight that it's their problem. They often think it's other people's problem, not understanding them. That, as you can imagine, makes treatment 
very difficult because how do you motivate someone to be treated if he or she thinks I'm perfectly okay, you're the person who should be treated. That's something we don't uncommonly hear from people suffering from schizophrenia. Th these are core symptoms, something that often um, accompanies these core symptoms in schizophrenia patients are disturb various disturbances of mood. So the anhedonia I explained to you before may actually develop into a real depressed mood so that they not only are anhedonic but they are sad, they feel hopeless, they have no, they have no positive visions about their future and things like that. They may also be anxious, remember misjudging facial emotions from other people may lead to sort of anxiety disorders, but they can also have these, these euphoric, manic states. They have delusions of grandeur, as explained before. They, are, they have the, the divine commandment from someone to save us all from the perils of, of an atomic war which will take place tomorrow morning if this person doesn't go out on the street and heal everybody. So that would be a delusion of grandeur, which you usually see people who are manic, but that also sometimes happens in schizophrenia patients. On the other hand, they can become suicidal, and that's, uh, that, that's something that's often underappreciated and underestimated even within the community of, of experienced psychiatrists. The risk for taking their own lives in schizophrenia patients is substantial. About 10% of all people who suffer from that disorder eventually kill themselves. And tragically, tragically, it's often the people who do very well on treatment after a first or second episode and go back to an almost normal life, but in realizing that they suffer from a very serious psychiatric disorder, they become so depressed and so hopeless that they take their own lives. This is, this is very, very tragic and, and something that we need to be well aware of that we don't, that we're not over optimistic when these people do very well after the various different social tre uh, treatments that we can offer, which I'll come back to as well. So these are just a few of the points of the ancillary syndrome of schizophrenia. Another common misjudgment that lay population, but also other medical doctors or, or psychologists who are not uh, directly involved in the business, relate to the fact that everybody thinks schizophrenia is a sort of lifelong disorder and once you fall ill, you stay ill for the rest of your life. That is not true. Thank God that's not true. There's a certain subgroup, albeit very small, of patients who only have one episode, maybe lasting a few months or half a year or sometimes even longer. But once that episode goes away and is treated well or subsides spontaneously, they never fall ill again. Of course, that, that's the ideal fate or course of schizophrenia that everybody wants to have. On the other hand, it can be a relapsing disorder, meaning that people have psychotic episodes, they, they recover from the psychotic episodes after treatment, then they're, they're healthy for a certain period of time, then they go back to falling ill again, usually because they stop treatment. But within the episodes, between the episodes rather, they do okay and they're basically healthy. The third version would be that people continuously get worse across their course of the disorder. So they have a psychotic episode, they get better. They have a next one, they get less better. They have a next one and they stay more chronically ill. And in the end, we have about 20% of patients who really stay chronically ill for the rest of their lives and, and need support from various sides and not, cannot live independently or by themselves. They need constant support. So between those ranges, of course, of the illness, there's a wide variation. Importantly, of course, this is also due to the fact whether or not these people are treated well or not. People who aren't treated well usually suffer from more chronic courses and would be the ones who continuously deteriorate, not always but often, who continuously deteriorate and stay at a certain level of chronicity after the fifth, tenth or fifteenth episode that they have experienced. Now how common is schizophrenia? What's your guess? What's the lifetime risk uh, of schizophrenia in percentage in the general population? What do you think? One. One percent. Okay, very good. Excellent. Do you get marks or anything uh, for being uh, so smart? Huh? 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 No? 
Louis, you have to give them marks. Eh? Eh? So it's about one in a hundred lifetime risk. Now that is pretty high. Diabetes, type 1 diabetes, is less than 1 in 100, for instance. So that, that it's a fairly common disorder. That also means that every one of you probably knows at least one person with schizophrenia. It may be someone who obviously is ill, or it may be someone who has this sort of you know, negative symptom dominated, where you think, well, this is a weird guy but he tags along nicely and he's not a problem. And, and he, he, often these people are parts of a group, but they're never really part of the group, but they're there and, and they're, they ride along and they, they go to the football matches together, they go skiing together, things like that. But they're always a little bit outside. So these could be people suffering from schizophrenia. I remember from my own medical school days, post hoc, there are two people that suffer from schizophrenia in, in, my, in my term. One of them I know for sure because after I went into psychiatry, he became my patient. But while he, we were in medical school together, nobody had the idea that this would be a person with schizophrenia. We just thought he's weird, or to use the modern term, he's strange. And the other was also a colleague. She, they, both of them basically also graduated from medical school, and, but they were already ill during medical school. So it's, it's more common than, than most of us would think or believe. <clears throat> so that, that's what, what's on that slide. And now I come back to the, uh, to the diagno diagnosis story. Or the, yeah, sure. Is that a difference in the prevalence based on regional or countries? No, there isn't. The, the question was, is there any prevalence with respect to, to regions or social class for that matter? It's a disorder that affects people from all classes by the way, also from both sexes, or if you believe in more than two sexes, then in all sexes, all over the world. And, and we have very good transcultural stories uh, that, so that tell us that uh, the population in, in, I don't know, Java has the same risk of schizophrenia as the one in the Antarctic or the one in the remote valleys of the Tyrol. Is there a significant age? Like yes, there is. There is. It's an, I may have it on a slide, or I may not. It's the age range, the, f the highest risk is in the second and third de decade of life. And so it's between like 15 and 25. Women generally fall ill five years later. Most likely they are protected by estrogen. Estrogen has an impact also on, on dopamine production and dopamine output. And since, as you'll hear, schizophrenia is related to disturbance in the dopaminergic transmission, that may be a protective factor for, for females. So they generally fall ill later, but it's about that age range, which also makes it a difficult disorder because it affects people in the prime of their lives. And very often before that, before your whole personality is fully developed, before you finished your studies or school, or, or before you hold a job, you fall ill. That's much more difficult with respect to rehabilitation than people who are already well-trained and may be socially well-adjusted and an and integral part of society. So that is a, that's an important point here. So basically, in medicine or in psychiatry, you have two sets of diagnosis. One is the global one, which is, uh, comes from the World Health Organization called ICD, International Classification of Diseases. We're currently still using number 10, but 11 is in development, will probably pop up uh, two years, one or two years from now, if they keep on track. They already promised it two years ago. And the other one is by the American Psychiatric Association called DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And we have a fairly new version that's two years old called DSM-5. So these are the two concepts that are fairly closely related to each other uh, to, the, to be used in, in diagnosing people suffering from psychiatric disorder. And this very technically tells you what DSM uses as the basis of a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And you start with these a symptoms here, and you'll recognize some of the words from the previous slides that I've described to you, namely delusions and hallucinations, but also these cognitive disturbances, the disorganization syndrome, and the behavior. I didn't discuss catatonia, but if you're interested, I can come back to that. And the negative symptom story, and there are certain criteria. You have to have two of those, and at least one of the first three in order to fulfill the diagnosis of schizophrenia. B, we have to rule out any 
potential somatic reason for such a syndrome. For instance, if you swallow a lot of LSD, you may also have similar symptoms, at least for a brief period of time. There are certain psychotomimetic drugs that can produce that syndrome, but also if you have a serious brain tumor or something of that sort, or certain type of epilepsy can mimic some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Therefore, any potential organic base for the syndrome has to be ruled out before we can make a diagnosis. Our most common issue nowadays is the influence of psychotropic drugs. There are a lot of people who look very schizophrenic, but the basis of their symptom really comes from ingesting all kinds of strange psychotropics. So without going into further detail here, just to mention the fact that we have a very clear classification system. And by the way, to come back to your question, that would be very different from the classification of system of delirium, where we had other symptoms. It's the course of the illness is very different in delirium than it is from schizophrenia. So there are very clear cut diagnoses, especially if you look over the longer course or longer term of the disorder. Sometimes it's difficult in, in, a, in a, a first show, first tell diagnosis, if you see the patient for the first time. But once you have a history of this patient, it's generally reasonably easy to diagnose. Yeah. Sorry? How accurate is the system in terms of diagnosis? The system is fairly accurate. The f if you, there, there are reliability check f checks for these diagnostic criteria. And for the full-blown syndrome of schizophrenia, if the people are re-diagnosed or diagnosed by others, the diagnosis usually is 80-85% 80, stays the same, which is different from other diagnoses in our field, but that's a fairly accurate and reliable diagnosis, the one on schizophrenia. Now, this is, um, this is a heuristic model of the reasons why people suffer from schizophrenia and includes, as you can see, a whole lot of factors that contribute to the risk and lastly contribute to the, to the outbreak of the disorder. It starts with, as everything, it starts with genetics. There is a, and I'll show you a slide on the genetic risk, I think the next or the, the, the one after that should be. So there is a genetic risk to it. These are, these are prenatal stressors. And then there is some perinatal stresses, for instance, uh, birth complication, gestational complications, or uh, stresses of, of, the, of the woman, of the mother. For instance, if she falls in in the second trimenon, there's a slightly higher risk that the child will then 20 years later develop schizophrenia than if she has a healthy pregnancy. So these would, all of these factors together constitute what we call a, a, a genetic and an acquired constitutional risk for schizophrenia, a certain vulnerability. Now mind you, vulnerable children and adolescents are healthy. They're vulnerable, but they don't show any signs or symptoms of the disorder yet. And it's still sort of enigmatic what then triggers the outbreak of the disorder, but usually, and you've heard about that, usually it's in, in, the, in these uh, post-pubertal development period, which for our brain is probably the last point in time when large-scale developments take place and things really change in the brain. You've all heard about the pruning story that we reduce synapses during our synaptic period. And there's a theory that people with schizophrenia have less pruning, so they have an over-input still in their system, one that we, for economical reasons, have sort of gotten rid of because it's not necessary as a grown-up to have so many synaptic uh, so many synaptic connections anymore because we've, we've learned most of the things that we need to learn to survive. So we downscale for an economical perspective because then we also need less nutrition, of course, if we, if we have less synapses. So all of this is probably disturbed in schizophrenia patients. Still, these people are healthy. What then happens is all kinds of sort of toxic factors or influences or stressors that affect this maturing, still maturing brain. And these can range from, from serious psychosocial consequences. For instance, it's been shown in the UK that people who, who are second generation migrants and live in, in, 
in very demanding psychosocial circumstances have a higher risk to the disorder. On the other hand, we also know that kids who smoke a lot of pot between the ages of 14 and 18, even if they stop smoking pot, have a higher risk, a fourfold or fivefold higher risk to develop schizophrenia later. And that's unrelated to the acute effects of, of cannabis, obviously. So all of these stressors can then sort of get the, get the whole brain and the information system in the brain un, in, an, in an unbalanced state and then leads to psychosis. Obviously, this whole complicated model can never be really tested. But what has been tested is all the sub-factors. The pharmacology has been tested, genetics has been tested, the uh, uh, transmission or dopamine hyperexpression has been tested, the, the risk of cannabis has been tested. So all of the domains, the separate domains on this slide, have been subjected. A lot of good research work and, and are pretty, have produced pretty uh, consistent results as risk factors for schizophrenia and for the disorder. And as I said, uh, I said I'll show you a few examples here. This is, this is the genetics. This is population genetics and not molecular genetics. In short, what it tells you is that if you suffer from schizophrenia, the risk that your children will have is tenfold higher than the children of someone who doesn't suffer from schizophrenia. Now, tenfold higher sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? On the other hand, remember, there's a 1% risk, and that is enhanced to a 10% risk if you have a schizophrenic mother or father, which still means that 90% of all the kids of mothers or fathers of schizophrenia go away unscathed and don't develop the disorder. So that is the, the you know the, the usual inconsistency between absolute and relative risk, and you always have to understand both numbers if you really want to want to evaluate a real risk factor. The other important part on this slide is is monozygotic twins. So twins that share all the genetic information. Now, if schizophrenia were a purely and classic genetic transmitted disorder, we would expect that every twin, every monozygotic twin will also develop schizophrenia, which doesn't happen. It's only about 50-50. So 50%, so that's a much higher risk than a regular twin, than a dizygotic twin, but it still tells you that 50%, so half of the monozygotic twins will not develop schizophrenia. So it cannot only be genetic, there must be other risk factors as outlined on that stress vulnerability slide I showed you before. <clears throat> Sorry? What means offspring of dual matings? Uh, yeah, that's a, yeah, that means that the, these are twins. These are twins that are not reared by their parents, but are, are open for, for adoption, for instance, and grow up in a totally different environment. Or, or twins from, from different parents also. So they have a, they have a different, th and that's, that's something that's very interesting. If you have a monozygotic twin there, and there are a number of twin studies that are around, because you could say, okay, monozygotic twins have a higher risk because they grow up in the same environment, they grow up with the same parents, so maybe the risk is not a risk that's truly genetic, but it's a risk in the upbringing, uh, in, the, in the nurturing of these kids. On the other hand, there are there are a lot of studies where these kids are adopted away because the mother, for instance, cannot deal with the child, and it's a monozygotic twin who grows up in a totally healthy environment as opposed to his brother or her sister who grows up in a, a pathogenic environment of a schizophrenic mother, but the risk for these two kids stays the same despite the fact that they grow up in a different environment. Is there evidence for um, HPA access influenced um Schizophrenia, uh, there is an HPA axis influence on basically everything you can think of. Huh? Neglect, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. I, I should mention all of these other factors contribute very little to the variance. So, for instance, the, if you are born in the winter, you have a higher risk to develop schizophrenia. But the contribution to the variance is half a percent, but it's still statistically significant. So th th you, you, have to, you have to be sure of the fact that you don't over-evaluate or over-judge these risk factors. Probably the most powerful and the strongest one is agenetics. And the second one that we have most evidence on is the influence of toxic substances like cannabis. Th these are pretty rock solid things. Uh, winter births and other things are, are of less relevance but contribute to the overall risk.
Now let me move into the system that's yeah. In? in spouses yep. it was the second. Yep. That's because there is something that's called, I don't have you heard the expression assortative mating? It's sort of birds of a feather flock together. So people with schizophrenia tend to have a higher chance of marrying other people who also suffer from schizophrenia. Maybe because they meet in a treatment facility or something of that sort. A lot, of the, a lot of the social context of schizophrenia patients is fairly limited, and often it's limited to other people suffering from schizophrenia or, or similar disorder. That, that's where that number comes from. So let me move to the dopamine system, because that's a system that's been best researched, and just, just very briefly reminding you of the important uh, dopaminergic pathways in the brain. Uh, they, they all more or less originate in the midbrain and they have different projections either into the cortex or into limbic areas or into other midbrain areas but the most relevant ones for the development of schizophrenia are probably uh, the one that leads into the mesolimbic into the limbic system called the mesolimbic pathway which is most likely hyperactive in schizophrenia patients and is the one that's related to the delusional part and to the hallucinations in people suffering from the disorder. This is a very complicated story. I'm really cutting it short here. And the other important pathway is the one that leads into the cortical areas called the mesocortical or mesofrontal pathway originating in the same system, namely around the, the, ment the ventral striatum. And that's probably hypoactive in schizophrenia patients and leads to the whole disorganization process on the disturbances in, in, in cognition and also the negative symptoms. That already tells you that therapeutically is a real challenge because one part of your brain is hyperactive from the dopaminergic neurotransmission point of view and the other part of the brain is hypoactive. So who do, how do you treat these people pharmacologically? And, and as you'll see, we have limits in, in our treatment options here. So basically, um, let me go over, the, over this quality of life story because it's obvious that these people have reduced quality of lives and, and move fairly quickly into the, into the treatment part. Maybe one thing that I'd, I'd like to mention here, people with schizophrenia in general live 20 years shorter than people who do not suffer from the disorder, do not suffer from serious disorders. They have a lot of comorbid also somatic disorders like uh, cardiovascular diseases and the like that they, they, they die from. And it's as yet unclear whether that's related to lifestyle or maybe also some genetic comorbidity, for instance, between diabetes and co-inheritance between diabetes and schizophrenia. So this is still open. What we know is that they generally have a very unhealthy lifestyle. They smoke a lot, for instance. They don't move around a lot. They don't eat in a very healthy fa fashion. They don't exercise which is one of the reasons why they have a higher risk for cardiovascular and cerebrovascular disorders. So they die considerably earlier, unfortunately. So what about treatment? And the, with respect to treatment, there is a, a package of treatments. The basic treatments are antipsychotic drugs, used to be called neuroleptics. These are all drugs that I'll show you that as well, that block dopamine receptors in the midbrain very important and thereby reduce the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. But next to the, to the pharmacological interventions, there are a number of psychosocial interventions which are very important and very relevant that range from, from classic psychotherapy into social rehabilitation treatment options that should be offered in, as a gold standard. People should be offered all of these together, which is not very easy because it's not available in all places in the world. It's, it's, it's expensive, it's complicated, and you have to have a lot of people on a treatment team. So these people should really be managed in specialized treatment or care centers, or at least seen there regularly. What is just very, very basically, what is the outcome of treating people with antipsychotic drugs? And the outcome is much more positive than most of you have probably thought of. If you diagnose someone with the first episode of schizophrenia fairly early, so within a few months, and start treating this person in a, with a good combination of, of drugs and psychosocial treatments, the likelihood that these people will remit 
from the disorder and will co recover, almost fully recover, uh, verges on the 70 to 80 percent range. So in principle, the schizophrenia has a good pro prognosis. I say in principle because a lot of the people are not diagnosed early, are not treated early, are not treated sufficiently, and therefore the outcomes are much worse in these patients than in, these I in this ideal case that I just described. But in principle, it's a disorder that responds very well to treatment. And importantly, as you've seen, that it has a relapsing course, that re these relapses can be reduced considerably and, e and effectively by continuous antipsychotic treatment. So if I showed you on that slide that 80% of all people that suffer from disorders have relapses, if you treated all of these 80% with antipsychotic drugs continuously, you could reduce the relapse risk to about 20%. The, the, these are pretty good numbers. And our colleagues in other fields of medicine uh, struggle to reach numbers of, of that optimistic outcome. And if you look at the effects of psychotropic drugs overall, you find that these effects are at least as good, not, not, if not better, than the effects of all kinds of other medications that people in internal medicine, neurology, dermatology, or what have you used. So it's, it's a real prejudice that all our drugs are only sedating and placebos. These drugs are very effective and are specifically effective against certain symptoms or certain illnesses that we diagnose. So how do these drugs work and what happens? And I, I come back to dopamine in these various systems. In this case, I use the, the mesolimbic pathway where I said the hallucinations originate. What happens there is that they're under stress these symptoms express and also express more dopamine than, the, than, the, than in other, in healthy, normal volunteers. And there, there's a dopaminergic overflow then, and there's increased hyper, there's a hyper excitability in dopaminergic receptors. So obviously what you do, what you can do is you try to reduce this by blocking postsynaptic dopamine receptors. This is what almost all of the drugs that we're currently using do thereby reducing the communication and the transmission between pre- and postsynaptic dopaminergic neurons. And do, through this, you reduce the symptoms or eliminate the symptoms of people suffering from the disorder. Now, this is just a list of antipsychotics that are currently available. And, and again, I, I just wanted to show you that they're loosely grouped into generations. The first generations were developed in the 50s. The second generation were developed in the 70s, last decade, obviously. And, and the newest ones have, been, have, been come, have come up to, uh, to approval in, in the past one or two years. So that's, a, uh, that, that's just a list of drugs. What do these drugs do well and what do they not do so well? What they do well is they reduce hallucinations and delusions. What they don't do so well is reduce negative symptoms and cognition. Again, going back to the pathophysiology of dopamine neuroenergic transmission that I explained to you before, this of course is obvious and clear. And this is, this is the big challenge that we're currently facing to develop medications that sort of cover the whole spectrum nicely and, and well without, without leading to too, many, to too many side effects and, and adverse events. And again, with respect to drug safety, just focus on the top uh, symptoms here because these are so typical for antipsychotic drugs. Also, if you think pathophysiology, fairly logical, which illness is the one where people have less dopamine than the rest of, our, than the rest of us, and that's Parkinson's, where dopaminergic syndrome uh, synapses degenerate, or dopaminergic neurons rather degenerate. Therefore, if we block dopamine uh, receptors via drugs, what you have is a certain risk of a Parkinsonian syndrome, an iatrogenic Parkinsonian syndrome. So you, you used to, when I studied in psychiatry, our wards all looked covered by patients that walked like this. This is totally changed now with the new medications, which have a much lower risk to induce these motor syndromes. By the way, they're all reversible when you stop the medication. So we don't, in, we don't induce real Parkinsonism or the disease, but we only induce the symptoms which can be reversed by stopping medication or using treatment. So these are some of the common problems that we have. Next to that, there is a range of metabolic issues, weight gain and, and other changes in, in lipids and, and glucose uh, 
that that have come to that have come to our attention in the past uh, 20 years or so that you can also deal with reasonably well if you cover them. So Parkinson, sometimes these Parkinsonian symptoms start earlier than the positive effects of treatment. So even after the first dose, you can have a patient having acute dystonia, for instance, and the symptoms aren't touched yet. This has to do with the adaptation of the system. So first you block it, then the system sort of compensates, and that's the same is true, of course, with the SSRIs and the serotonin system where also the, 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 the positive effects come, often come a little later after the, after the adverse events. It has to do with, the, with, comp with compensatory efforts of the, of the postsynaptic receptors, which are opposed to the fact, of course, of being blocked and then produce additional receptors to compensate for this deficiency, but there's a limit to that, and that's when the therapeutic effects kick in. This is one of the explanations why there is a sort of retarded effect of these medications on the, on the syndromes we treat. Now, I briefly mentioned psychotherapy, and I, again, I, I won't go into any detail here, but we can maybe, uh, I, I see I'm already pretty late. When was I supposed to stop now? Is that? Five minutes. Okay, so I'll, show, I'll use five minutes to show you the summary slide, and and maybe you have some additional question. And I apologize for for the tour de force and for skipping some of the basic psychopharmacology part. But maybe if you have one or two specific questions, I'd be more than happy to address them. Thanks for listening.